chapter 6 of Ecclesiastes, chapter 7 of Ecclesiastes. We began this last week, and here's what we're going to see here. As we read through quickly through Ecclesiastes 7, the topic is adversity and prosperity. Uh, the concept here is that both adversity and prosperity have their place. Both adversity and prosperity can tempt you to leave wisdom at some point because if you get too prosperous, you'll throw away your wisdom, your truth, your understanding and start chasing this prosperity, which is temporal. It's a chasing after the wind. Or you could face adversity and lose wisdom, which tells you this is also temporary. Your adversity right now is just temporary. It's not your eternal state. It's, and and you, you can't control certain things. Wisdom is better than, than foolishness. But even then, wisdom, wisdom can't answer all the questions. That was established early in the book. You can, you, it's better to have wisdom than to just live a carnal life. But even if you've got wisdom, there are going to be things you can't explain. There's going to be a limit to these. So here we go, chapter 7, verse 1. I think we had the first four of these on, on the notes. I'm going to read down, let's say, I'll just read down to verse, say, 14 right now. Chapter 7, verse 1 through 14. A good name is better than fine perfume, and the day of death better than the day of birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for death is the destiny of every man. The living should take this to heart. Now again, heart refers to the moral compass, the thing that you're, you're making decisions with, the, the, the thing that you find priorities and you evaluate and, and decide what is morally right, what is wrong. Sorrow is better than laughter because a sad face is good for the heart. Again, makes you, again, makes you reflective. Again, this is, this is saying, it's not saying laughter is bad. It's just saying adversity and sorrow is sometimes better because you're actually slowed down and thinking and keeping things in perspective as long as it doesn't overwhelm you. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. Notice every one of these verses is saying, Here's, here's happiness, here's laughter, but don't take your eye off. This might be the place you really want to be, the house of mourning. But the heart of the fools is in the house of pleasure. It is better to heed a wise man's rebuke than to listen to the songs of fools. Like the crackling of thorns under the pot, so is the laughter of fools. In other words, it's just fuel for the fire, and the laughter is just making things hotter, and, and you're getting in more trouble. This too is meaningless. Again, when he gets to that point of this too is meaningless, the point is there, there's no explanation. There's no end of this. Sometimes you need to laugh and have fun, but there's a balance to that. Sometimes you need to mourn, but you can't just mourn your life away because you've got to come across over here and enjoy life also. So even this advice is like, man, when do you do this? It's hard to know. And when it talks about meaningless, vanity, it's a vapor, it means temporary. It means it's, it's so hard to grab a hold of. When do you apply it? Verse 7, extortion turns a wise man into a fool. So now you've got a wise man with extortion, and he's going away from what his wisdom was saying. He begins to act like a fool. And a bribe corrupts the heart. So again, there's that money. When you get, when you get off balance, you can look at this prosperity and it can even take the wise man who knows better, but man, I've got my eye on this, and pretty soon you're making decisions you wish you hadn't made. Uh, verse 8, the end of a matter is better than its beginning, and patience is better than pride. Do not be quickly provoked in your spirit, for anger resides in the lap of fools. Again, he's pointing out some values here as far as uh, uh, you know, uh, be thinking or speaking quickly, or being provoked. And once again, just stay calm and let things develop. Don't always have a response. Let things develop. Because, again, we don't know exactly all the details in anything. Do not say, why were the old days better than these? For it is not wise to ask such questions. Why is it not wise to ask such questions? Because they're based in perception. The old days one, you've forgotten, the Bible or the book of Ecclesiastes even talks about, we forget what took place, and all the details that we forgot have been replaced with, many times, fabricated stories or false emotions. We forget the negative, remember the joy, and say, why were the old days better than these? They weren't. I mean, necessarily. It's just that 
we have chosen the things we wanted to remember and we've created some fantasies, we've told the stories. For it is not wise to ask such questions. Otherwise, you're looking back over your shoulder at these good old days, which really weren't that good. You're, you're fantasizing, not about, the last week we talked about the fool talks about dreams, I'm gonna go out here and do this, and I'm gonna go out and do this. When you're oppressed, when there are many afflictions or adversities, that's when dreams are many. When you don't like your job, life is oppressive, then you spend a lot of time talking about, here's what I'm going to do. I've got this idea, we're gonna start this. If we would do this, we could make some money, we could move here, and everything would be better. You're dreaming about the future. It's like, the reason you're dreaming about the future is you don't like today. Deal with today, face reality. Stop thinking about the future and dreaming about it, making up your future. This is just the opposite. Now you're looking at, the day is so difficult, it was so much better back there. Well, that, that's not wise. Don't look back. Again, it doesn't talk about you know, we learn from the past, we have good memories from the past, but you spend all your time looking backwards, and it's like you're living here today, and one of the topics, I think, of this whole book is God's reality. You live in God's reality, not your reality. I mean, you can't create your own universe. Do not say, why were the old days better than these? For this is not wise to ask such questions. Verse 11, Wisdom, like an inheritance, is a good thing and benefits those who see the sun, meaning the living. So again, just like you can receive an inheritance, financial, property, you can receive wisdom. And it is a good thing. It is a good thing for those who are living to have this wisdom. And now we're going to start switching to wisdom, a little bit talking about wisdom. Wisdom is a shelter as money is a shelter. So again, these are both true. And I know there's a proverb that bothered me many years ago when I first read it. It said, uh, the rich man answers harshly, or the wealthy man answers boldly. And it's kind of like, well, that's not very nice. I mean, when I was younger, I read it that way. And then I began to realize, the wealthy man, the man who's established, he doesn't have to worry about what you think. He's financially established. He's got his position. This is the truth I speak. It's like, well, that was rude. No, it was bold. That was offensive. And see, that's what we get in, you know, you start thinking as our, our, our politically correct, tolerant America. Well, that guy didn't answer neutrally, kind of right down the middle where everybody would accept it. He just boldly says, this is what I think. It's like, oh, how do you get away with that? He's wealthy. You can't hurt him. He's got enough money. He can talk that way. And the same thing right here. Wisdom is a shelter as money is a shelter. So you can build a fortress around yourself and be bold and be protected by your wisdom. You can also build a shelter and protect yourself by your finances. Neither one of those is negative. The more money you've got, the bigger, better foundation you've got, the more you can state your opinion and not worry about people turning their back on you. You can turn your back and walk away, it doesn't matter. And the same thing, wisdom. If you know the truth, you know how to deal with it, you can, you've got yourself protected. Now this is talking about shelter or protection. Now eventually, it's gonna talk here, both wisdom and money can be a shelter, but you can't, and, and righteousness is gonna be right in here. Righteousness is gonna be a shelter. You live righteously, we know this from biblical teaching, you live the right way, you do the right thing in God's universe, in God's creation, you follow God's laws, you live right, it will work. It's, it's designed to work that way, except sometimes it doesn't because we live in a fallen world and there's more going on than God just giving you the good life. One thing we've got to get away from, I think, and it's important to understand, especially in our culture, is the Christian life is not about seeking Jesus for your good life. I mean, it's like, it's like an insurance program. If you accept Jesus, are you willing to accept Jesus and accept the good life he's got planned for you? Okay, I guess it's better than I can do. So I'll accept the good life Jesus has for me. Well, that's not, the, that's not what he's offering you. He's offering you deliverance from your sin, salvation from sin, and con being conformed, transformed into his image. Well, what about the good life that he's got planned for me? Martyrdom, you mean? Persecution? As they persecuted me, they'll persecute you? It's like, th there's no guarantee of a good life. Jesus isn't offering good life. He says, I have life and life abundant, but it's not an ideal of, of prospering and being richer. Now understand, this is all balanced because throughout the Old Testament, as we can see even in the New Testament references, you live godly, you follow God's rules, you do what's right, God's called you to do, 
the world's designed to function that way. If it, you know, think about Paul talking to uh, the Romans about government. You follow the government, you're obedient to the government, it will go well with you. Why? Because you're not a criminal. Follow the speed limit. It's not a big deal. Pay your taxes. It's not a big deal. Just follow the rules. If you follow the rules of government, if you follow the rules of family, you follow the rules of marriage, you just follow the institutions God has established and you, you pursue wisdom, make good choices, things will work out for you. The first the commandment, right? The first commandment with a promise, Paul writes. Uh, honor your father and mother that it may go well with you and you may live a long time in the earth. Why is that even a promise in the Ten Commandments? Because if you as a child can learn to obey mom and dad and be respectful, be obedient, and learn to follow authority, you'll then be able to transfer that understanding into the classroom. And when the teacher says sit down, you'll sit down. When the teacher teaches you math, you will learn math. You'll learn whatever the teacher's teaching. When the cop tells you here's the speed limit, you'll obey the cop. Uh, whatever they say pay taxes you won't try to cheat you'll figure your taxes you'll pay your taxes it will go well with you if you can learn to follow obey mom and dad you'll obey your teachers your coaches you'll get scholarships you'll get good grades you'll go to college you'll get a good job you'll listen to your boss you'll get promoted he'll entrust you with things you'll be like Joseph it went well for him because he did what was right so I mean there is that concept but at the same time look at Joseph as an example while he's still being obedient He's being crushed all along the way. He's sold into slavery. He's put into prison. They're lying about him. It's like, but he continued to do what was right. So understand, there is a balance here. But prosperity, <coughs> wisdom, wherever wisdom is, here's righteousness, wisdom, these things, you, you, prosperity is a good thing. It will provide some shelter, but not against everything. Wisdom has its limitations. It will provide shelter. It's a good thing, but it has limitations. Righteousness, it's a good thing. You'll learn to be obedient. You'll follow you know, the, the good rules that God has established. But look at Job. It doesn't guarantee everything. There are limitations on all these. And eventually this all comes down to sometimes things happen that we don't understand. And we're going to continue reading here. Chapter 6, verse 12. Wisdom is a shelter as money is a shelter. But the, but the advantage of knowledge is this, that wisdom preserves the life of its possessor. So that in verse 12 is talking about wisdom, money, and now wisdom. Wisdom is a shelter and money is a shelter, but the advantage of knowledge of this is that it preserves the life. You can use it. You can, you can decide on the moment how to put it in play. It preserves your life. Verse 13, consider what God has done. Who can straighten what he has made crooked? When times are good, be happy, but when times are bad, consider. God has made the one as well as the other. Therefore, a man cannot discover anything about his future. Now, that's kind of that's kind of some that's a summary verse of putting these things that I've said together: prosperity, wisdom, and then it's that, right then it stops right there after saying this is a shelter, this is a shelter, wisdom it preserves your life. But stop, remember, consider what God has done. What has God done? Right, you don't know what God has done, nor do you know what God is doing. He's revealed certain things to us. But all we know all things work together for the love, those who love the Lord, but we don't know how or how it's all going to come together. That's beyond. That's what Koalef was looking for, and he can't get there. Job couldn't get there. The prophets couldn't get there. Paul couldn't get there. He just had to say, we trust God. We live by faith. Now, here it says right here. So consider what God has done. What has he done? Well, what he, who can straighten what he has made crooked? If he takes this and he turns this, you're prosperous, but now that prosperity fades away. Or you've got wisdom, but that wisdom can't deliver you. Or you're living righteous, and he says to Satan, Satan, if you considered my servant Job, Job, Job and, and, and Satan says, well, you're just protect, he's just worshiped you because you, you've given him everything and you built a hedge around him. He says, okay, you can take everything he's got, but don't take his life. And now all of a sudden your righteousness has got you what? face to face, toe to toe with the devil. It's like, I've been following God to protect me from the devil and God took me and put me right in the middle, right in front of the devil. And it says, now we talked about this on Sunday, the word Satan in Hebrew means adversary or accuser would be better. Accuser would be better. And you can see this being done, and this is just throwing this real quickly out from church on Sunday. 
when Peter and John, Jesus were, for example, at, at, at the Last Supper there, the, 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 in John, uh, Jesus says, Peter, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. That seems to be Satan's role. Remember, Satan is not, we don't have this dualistic po power where you've got God over here fighting against Satan, and they're like, ah, trying to decide who's going to win the universe. It's never been a battle. God is on top. God is in the heavens above the heavens. I mean, he is, he is, he is the top dog. And Satan is under him all the time, every time. Now, Satan has rebelled, but that rebellion still can't take Satan out of the, the, the orbit of operation. He is still in God's operation. So when Satan goes on a mission, it's been approved by God. Now, again, we need to do more angelology on this and study. But Satan is not out doing things that God can't control. If he does, for some out reason, break rank, they'll end up in, apparently, uh, in Tartarus, where the angels who rebelled during Noah's day were removed, removed from history. So, Satan is the accuser, and whenever you see him in the Bible, basically what he's doing, Peter was told by Jesus, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, which means you sift wheat to shake out the grain, to keep the grain and, and, and shake out what you don't want. In other words, Satan says, I want to see what Peter's made out of. And what did Jesus say? He said, Satan asked to sift you like wheat. And I says, no, I bind you, Satan, in Jesus' name. No, Jesus says, but Peter, I prayed for you. So when you recover, strengthen your brother. He's like, well, what, 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 what did you, Satan asked to sift me? And what did you say? Well, I, I don't, that, that's between me and Satan, but I'm telling you, when he's done and you recover, Go strengthen your brother. So he is going to sit me. Oh, yeah. And he's going, to, he's going to shake me down. I'm going to be on my knees. Oh, yeah. But you'll recover because you've got something that he's going to be able to find out that you've got some faith. So in other words, Satan came to sift Peter. Satan was encouraged by God to, to sift Job. Have you considered my servant Job? Yeah, but you've got him so protected, I can't even get to him. He only worships you because he, well, he says, go take it from him. Sift him. Sift him and let's see what he's made out of. Oh my gosh, that's not the Christian God I worship. It's like he's protecting me. It's like, no, Satan is the accuser and God apparently is willing to allow that accuser to sift you to find out what you're made of. So sometimes your prosperity, your wisdom, and even your righteousness, right here it is, verse 13. Consider what God has done. Who can straighten what he has made crooked? When times are good, be happy. But when times are bad, consider. God has made the one as well as the other. Sometimes, like Paul. I mean, Paul prays three times. Take this thorn from me. A messenger, Paul says, a messenger of Satan was sent to me to buffet me, to torment me. And I went to God like Job went to God. Like Coleth went to God. Like, like others have gone to God. Like Jesus, or, or Peter went to Jesus. Like, take this away from me. Oh, no. He says, three times I asked the Lord, take this from me. He says, no. He says, my, my strength is made perfect in weakness. It's like right here. He says, you're being sifted, and he can't break you. He can only make you stronger on another dimension because there's something to you. Now, again, if there's no substance, if there's no wheat, say you're Judas, you get shaken, you get ripped apart, and you collapse and are brushed off into eternal damnation. You have nothing there. Judas was sifted just like Peter was sifted. Peter had something he recovered, and you can hear those, we went through 1 Peter and 2 Peter, you can hear those words of Peter talking about a faith as pure as gold, as more valuable than pure gold. What is Peter talking about? He's talking about getting up off of his knees saying, wow, <laughs> okay. And he encouraged them using the same words to the brethren to strengthen them. He, he's doing exactly what Jesus wanted him to do. So, Coleth is finding this out. You want prosperity, it's shelter. You want wisdom, it's shelter. You want to do what's right and live righteously because that's how God made the world to work. Follow the rules. But who knows what God is doing? If God has twisted it, you can't make it straight. God made one as well as the other. Sometimes you're going to face adversity. Sometimes you're going to lose all that you've worked for. Sometimes you're going to be righteous and get persecuted or have disastrous results. 
therefore, the point, therefore, a man cannot discover anything about his future. You can't have enough money, you can't have enough wisdom, and you can't have enough righteousness because at any moment, the times might change. Oh, so now the point here. So it's, 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 it's foolishness. Now watch. In the prophet's day, what, who's the prophet? Uh, it's, it's, is it Habakkuk? No, Malachi. Malachi. Malachi says, God was accusing the priests and the people of Israel because they would say, it's, it's useless to follow the Lord. It does us no good to follow the Lord because we're keeping all the rituals. We're following all the wisdom. And, we're, and, and it's not working out. It's like, it says, then a group got together who feared the Lord and their names were written down. They took note because some people realized we're not serving God for prosperity. We're not just pursuing wisdom so we can have a good life and living righteous so everything... Because at some point, it's going to seem futile to serve God. You try to live your life right, and then all of a sudden, everything falls apart. And again, how hard is that? To just have everything dissolve and fall apart. And you're Job, or you're Peter, or somebody. You've got to pick yourself up off of your knees and say, Okay, I don't understand. God has made one as well as the other. I will still fear God. Therefore, a man can discover nothing about his future. I'll just keep serving God. To continue to pursue righteousness, to pursue wisdom, to know prosperity is not the final goal, is really the ultimate. When you, when you have nothing, is to continue with that hope. I'm not sure I didn't end that very strongly, but that's kind of what we're talking about here. I think you understand that. Verse 15. Now we go to verse 15 through 18. The topic here now, we're really going to focus in on righteousness. And you'd think that God ideally... Uh, just if just a, a, a bullet point if you live righteous God rewards you with good things the wicked then are punished with bad things God brings punishment to the wicked sometimes you see that in life immediately but sometimes you don't and that's what this is about right here the timeliness of God's judgment God is going to judge both the righteous and the wicked but you don't know when it's going to take place that's beyond our understanding in the me verse 15, in this meaningless life of mine, I have seen both of these. Coleth is writing this now. Again, he calls this, his life meaningless. Again, don't, don't go too negative on meaningless. because It means vanity. It means emptiness. It, it means temporal. It means uh, uh, like a mist. It's there and it's gone. So again, it doesn't mean his life has no meaning as much as it means in this brief temporal life that everything I accomplish is going to disappear. The buildings are going to go to someone else, the wealth I've accumulated, even the things I write down, people are going to forget. So nothing that I've done, my life is just a vapor coming and going. He's not denying the eternal value of it, but in this temporal life, in this vapor life that he's got of mine, he says, I've seen both of these. A righteous man perishing in his righteousness. Meaning this man is going out of his way to serve God and please Him, and he's perishing the further he goes. It's not working for him. At least it's not working Joel Olstein style. You see? Right there. I mean, that is right there. You have a problem with your, 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 your philosophy, your vision, your worldview, the, your best life now. Cola says, I've seen in my meaningless life, in my temporary life, in my life of vapor, I've seen this. A man pursuing righteous, pleasing God, finding out what God created him for, and perishing the closer he gets falling apart as his life is just falling apart the more he closer he gets to God. Explain that. So really righteous and that's the, God got angry in Malachi with those who says it's, it's useless to follow God. Get your part now because if you serve God it doesn't matter. He's not even paying attention. And the other thing he saw, a wicked man living long in his wickedness. Now right there it's like because wicked people you don't want to be wicked because God will kill you. So Cola says, well, no, I've seen some wicked people live a long, long time. It doesn't seem like God even knows they're around. The point here is going to be, you don't control God. But that doesn't, that doesn't change what's right and what's wrong. Do not be over-righteous, neither be over-wise. Why destroy yourself? In other words, don't, don't try to, again, over-righteous. How can you be over-righteous? I think that's got to refer to this right here, where you're not just pursuing the righteousness of God and be, trying to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. That's self-righteousness. You're trying to build that shelter around yourself. I'm going to do everything right so that my life doesn't fall apart. It's like, no, that's not the reason you're righteous. 
You're not righteous because this way my life will be safe. You're righteous. You're seeking after God. You're not seeking after a long life. And so many times people are in church, I, I know this, people are pursuing Jesus Christ so that he'll do good things for them. They've got like this, this contract. I'll come to church. I'll be do right things. I won't do these things. I will have a good testimony. And then God, he'll take care of me, right? Well, Solomon says, I have seen the righteous man perishing in his righteousness. So maybe not. So, do not be over-righteous, neither be over-wise. You can't protect yourself fully in wisdom. You can't protect yourself. If your whole idea is just to protect yourself, you have already you don't have, already don't have enough wisdom because wisdom would say you can't have enough wisdom to protect yourself. So, why destroy yourself? How are you going to destroy yourself? You're going to eventually get to the point where you're frustrated because I did everything right. I was wise. I followed every letter of the law. And then all these bad things happened to me. And you ruin your life because you throw your faith away. You throw your soul away because I thought I had it under control. You don't have it under control. That's what we just read. God has made one as well as the other. Therefore, no one knows your future. Do what's right because it's the right thing to do and it pleases God. You serve God. He doesn't serve you. Big, big statement right there. We oftentimes do righteous things because we want God to serve us in return. That's not. You are here to serve God, which means you might do righteous things because it's the right thing to do and God may do nothing. You're serving God. He's not serving you. Now, again, we got all those promises. We'll get off and argue with that. But the point of this is, we serve God. He doesn't serve us. When you become overly righteous and you start trying to manipulate God or you become pursuing wisdom so you can control God, you're into a form of sorcery, of witchcraft, where you're trying to control. You might as well get into astrology where you're trying to control the fate by doing certain things in the physical realm. You're righteous not because you're trying to control God. God, will you bless me if I do this? Again, we know that when you follow God, there are blessings and natural things that work out. And we know God can say, I bless you, and he can do what he wants as far as choosing and blessing. But your righteousness is not going to manipulate God. It says, who understands him? God, God made one as well as the other. Verse 16, do not be over-righteous, neither be over-wise. Why destroy yourself? Do not be over-wicked, and do not be a fool, becoming too carnal, or again, just throwing everything away. You say, well, I'll just go over and live like the world. No. Why die before your time? Because you go there and say, well, I can get away with anything. God doesn't see. No, you go live like a fool. You, you, you live in a wicked life. You will die young. That's, that's awesome. And that's, that's part of the guarantee. Because if you don't learn to obey your father and mother, then you will not learn to be obedient and live long in the earth. Those who fail to be obedient to their parents are often the ones who fail to listen to their teachers, fail to listen to the law officials, fail to listen to the government. They end up in prison. They end up in trouble. They end up in some kind of you know, dark underworld of some sort. And uh, they destroy themselves. Why? Because they were wicked. Verse 17, do not be over wicked and do not be a fool. Why die before your time? It is good to grasp the one and not let go of the other. The man who fears God will avoid all extremes. In other words, there's a place to live righteously, but there's a place to live in the world without becoming sinful and wicked. You can't isolate yourself from it. Again, the NIV says all extremes. The footnote on my Bible says, uh, uh, it says, the man who fears God will avoid all extremes or will follow them both. Am I in the right place? We'll follow them both. Yeah, we'll follow them both. Okay. Verse 19, wisdom makes one, wise, makes one wise man more powerful than ten rulers in a city. Now we're off into another topic here. We switch down here in my notes. Uh, here it says, righteousness is not always uh, protection. Wisdom has its limitations. And now what we're going to state here in 19, 24, and 25, 29 is kind of what we've already established. I'll just read through these quickly. It's basically saying these things have limits. Wisdom makes one wise man more powerful than ten rulers in a city. Just because you're a ruler and there's ten of you, if you have one wise man who really understands, he can outpower ten rulers. There is not a righteous man on earth who does what is right and never sins. Do not pay attention to every word people say, or you may hear your servant cursing you. For you know in your heart that many times you yourselves have cursed others. So now, when it starts talking about righteousness here, there's not one righteous man on earth. The idea is we all sin, and be careful when you start, you know, listening, because about the time you think you're righteous, 
you're going to hear even your servant, and this would be someone who's talking about someone who's got a servant, you know, you may even hear your servant cursing you. Because if we actually went and talked to the people closest to you, and in this case right here, your servant in this, in this culture, in my case it would be my wife, not that she's my servant, but she's the one closest to me. Uh, it's like, well, Galen's, Galen's perfect, Galen's righteous. It's like, well, go talk to Tony. It's like, okay. And that's what this is saying, because about the time you start trusting in your righteousness, you're going to hear your servant say something like, well, he's not, so I heard this or I saw that. They see you behind closed doors. And then it goes on in verse 22. For you know in your heart that many times you yourself have cursed others, like in the privacy of your own home. So don't be flaunting your righteousness, because if we actually found out, you know, it would be, we've, there's proof. Verse 23. All this I tested by wisdom, and I said. So these are all things he's put together. This is what his conclusion, conclusion in this point was. I am determined to be wise, but this was beyond me. Whatever wisdom may be, it is far off and most profound. Who can discover it? So that was his goal. I'm going to become wise and get this thing wrapped up and solve all the problems. He says, it's too far gone. It's too far removed. We cannot get there. We're always going to have loose ends. And when you got loose ends, you, don't, you can't control your future. 25, so I turned my mind to understand, to investigate, and to search out wisdom and the scheme of things, and to understand the stupidity of wickedness and the madness of folly. Now remember, when he talks about wickedness and then folly here, sometimes the wickedness, of course, would be sinfulness, but sometimes that folly is just carnal living. And other places in the book, it talks about carnal living, not, not in a sinful way, but enjoying life, of enjoying the buildings you built, of enjoying your, your, the trees you planted, of enjoying uh, your meals. So again, this doesn't always have to refer to extreme wickedness as much as, you know, just life itself. Verse 26, I find more bitter than death the woman who is a snare, whose heart is a trap, and whose hands are chains. The man who pleases God will escape her, but the sinner she will ensnare. Now that goes right back to Proverbs talking about the woman who is this, the, the one who captures the man. And that is a, 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 an example or a weakness in man in this case here. And I, again, you could make this a metaphor of saying when it talks about men, it talks about mankind, and the woman represents some kind of a temptation of some sort. But if we leave this just as a male man, the female is the woman who can trap the man. Is like it can, it can ruin his life. It can put a chains on him in a variety of ways. So in other words, just like Proverbs is warning the young man, be careful who you choose, who you hook up with, because this woman is going to be either be a crown on your head and lead you to great things, or this woman is going to drag you like an ox off the slaughter. That's Proverbs. The woman has great power over the man. She can hook up with him and make his life great. Proverbs 31, woman, and, and other things, she'll be a crown on his head. Or she can be the one who drags him as an ox going to the slaughter. So don't just trust any woman. Again, that, that this is in the context. Again, you can make that a metaphor, or you can leave it in the context of the female woman. Verse 27. Uh, Okay, here, let's go back there. The man who pleases God will escape her. Now, who's the man who pleases God? It's going to be the man who's pursuing righteousness on the correct level, pursuing wisdom for the right reason, uh, prosperous, busy, making money, taking care. This man right here is seeking God. He will be, it will be clear, you'll be able to see this woman coming and avoid her. But the sinner, the one who's seeking righteousness to manipulate God, the one who's seeking wisdom to control his life, this woman's going to move in like a chain around his hands and drag him away like an oxus lab because you're not really pursuing God. You're trying to manipulate God. You're trying to have your best life now, and this woman's going to come in, and you're not going to see her come. So this verse again, it says, the man who pleases God will escape her. If you're pursuing God, you'll see her coming. But if you're just faking like you're pursuing God and you're living for righteousness, trying to make it work for your benefit, you're, you're the, you know, the, 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 I would just say the fake Christian, you're just using religion for your own benefit, you, you'll be ensnared by her. She will bring you down. Verse 27, look, says the teacher, or Koleth, this is what I have discovered. Adding one thing to another to discover the scheme of things. So in other words, he's adding one to another, putting all his pieces together. While I was still searching, but not finding 
He's putting all these things together, doing all of his evening research and putting, you know, adding up his formulas and his figures. Uh, while I was still searching but not finding, I found one upright man among a thousand, but not one upright woman among them all. Now, <laughs> whoa, did you really read that out loud? Okay, whoa, no. Let's get away. Again. You can say, well, at least there's a slight, very slight percent of finding a good man, but you'll never find an upright woman. One of the commentators says, be careful right here in reading this literally as if it's a mathematical formula. This a commentator from Dallas Theological Seminary, you know, good Bible school, says this is a Hebrewism. It's an example, meaning it's, it's one out of a thousand men, which is like the chance of winning the lottery. It's like one in a thousand and the women, you'll never find one. Meaning, there's no, there's no righteous men. And there's no, right, I mean, there's no righteous men. His way of saying it, one in a thousand, you might possibly, but you'll never find a righteous man. Meaning, there's nobody out there right. It lines up with the New Testament. There are no one righteous. Everyone's manipulated by their sinful nature. Everybody's got their own scheme, their own selfish agenda. And that's what we've been delivered from. That's what we're being conformed away from. It's, it's in us. We have that selfish nature. We're using everybody for our own advantage. We're using every situation for ourselves. And we're trying to be conformed into the image of Christ and form, serve, or serve God, become a servant of Jesus Christ. But anyway, he's saying this, adding one thing to another, discovering the scheme of things while I was still searching but not finding. I found one upright man among a thousand, but not one upright woman among them all. This only have I found. God made mankind upright. Watch this. But men have gone in search of many schemes. And when it, now, now right here when it says mankind, God made mankind upright. He's now using a term referring to humanity. He made Adam and Eve, mankind, upright. But what happened? They went in search of many schemes. Now in chapter 7, verse 29, you see that word right there? Uh, in search of many schemes. This have I found. God has made mankind upright, but men have gone in search of many schemes or many devices. They, God has made them upright. He gave them truth. He gave them dominion in the garden again. And what happened? They turned their backs on it and went in search of something else. This Hebrew word devices is the same Hebrew word over here in chapter 7, verse 25. Chapter 7, verse 27. Uh, let's look at 25. So I turned my mind to understand, to investigate, and to search out wisdom in the scheme of things, and to understand the stupidity of wickedness and the madness of folly. Right there it says 25, the scheme of things, or some Bibles translate that explanation. He's wanting an explanation. How are things put together? And so here's translated schemes the same way in the NIV they translate it consistently. Verse 27, look, says the teacher, this is what I have discovered adding one thing to another to discover the scheme of things or the explanation of things. He's trying to find God's explanation. In other words, he's trying to find God's scheme, God's plan. In chapter 25 and 27, verses 25 and 27, Koaleth is saying, I've gone in search of God's plan. I've gone in search of God's explanation. God's scheme. Why is this? And he says, it's beyond me. I can't understand it. So what has mankind done? Well, God made them upright. You just come to God and he'll take care of it. But instead of coming to God, what has man done? He's turned his back on God, who's got all the schemes and explanations figured out himself, turned his back on God and went in search of what? Many schemes. Now I can say this very simply. This is the truth. You don't know it because those things are hidden in God, but you do know Jesus Christ. You do know what has been revealed to you. You know this. This is the truth. And many things are still hidden in God. They're mysteries. We'll never understand them. Job found that out. Paul found that out. Throughout the Bible, it's been that way. Coleth is discovering that. But man doesn't want God. He wants to go in search of his own explanation. So when he can't find this right here, you're not satisfied with this. You're not satisfied with God. You turn and go after many other schemes. These are called idols in the Old Testament. This I can't understand. I'll go over here and create my own. This is now the way it works. It's a false idol. That's not really true. Yes, but it, it's, I can explain it. No, you can't. You created it yourself. Or I would call these today 
philosophies, world views. You can't understand, you can't accept Jesus Christ and the fullness of Jesus Christ. This is in the, the Titanic faith book, the concept. You can't accept the fullness of Jesus Christ because it's beyond understanding, but it's all in Christ. You have to be patient. You have to have faith. You have to trust Him. There's many things we do understand, but there's things that we want answers for that you can't have answers for. And so instead of trusting God, we turn around and we create our own philosophy, materialism. Or we create some kind of, uh, what would we say, secular humanism. Or we try to, you know, evolution or whatever. We take something out of creation and make it into the idol and try to explain everything from that form of creation. Now we're into Romans chapter 1. Okay, so that's where it's at. I'll read that last part right there. What time is it getting to be? Yes, time to quit. Chapter 7, verse uh, 28. While I was still searching but not finding, I found one upright man among a thousand, but not one upright woman among them all. The point there, universally, there's nobody there. The odds of finding somebody perfect, you're not going to. This only have I found. He says, this is what I came to. The, this is what I can find. And this is in Genesis. It's throughout the Bible. It's in the Gospel. It's part of the Gospel. God made mankind upright. He made mankind good. He gave him certain information, put him in dominion in the garden, says, this is yours. But don't go over there and mess with the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It's not for you. Don't go there. Stay here and have dominion. But men have gone in search of many schemes. And it started with the knowledge of good and evil. Saints says, well, come over here. You'll be just like God. It's like, you'll know the things God knows. And ever since then, we've been trying to become like God. When we get to the place where we've got to just accept God's reality, I don't understand it. Solomon didn't understand it. We want to prosper. We want to have wisdom. We want to have righteousness. So that will keep us safe? Not always. You can't control everything. You've got to trust God. And sometimes he doesn't even reward the right time or punish in the right time. What God has twisted or made straight, you can't twist. What God has twisted, you can't make straight. It's in God's hands. Well, I don't want that. So I'm going to come over here and make my own device. Here's what I think. And now we start getting false philosophies. We start opening up universities and start corrupting the next generation with a false philosophy. And they will never now find the truth. And now you're into the sin of Jeroboam where they can't repent of it because you've hidden this from them because you call this craziness, you call this old-fashioned, this is delusional, and you're cramming them with idols and philosophies or the device of mankind, and your culture is now sunk. You can't repent because you don't even know what sin is. You don't even know what right or wrong is. You think Christianity is love and tolerance and peace and just accept everybody. It's like, what? No, Christianity is just the opposite. No one is accepted. Everyone is wrong. Everyone is condemned. Everyone's in trouble. Everyone needs to repent. You've got to come back to the truth. The truth will set you free. Not love and tolerance and patience. Love, tolerance, and patience over here in, in, in the idolatry, the device of mankind. Yeah, but that'll bring everybody in. That's Tower of Babel material. You've got to come back to God, and by coming back to God, you've got to repent and begin changing. Oh, no, everybody's accepted by God. No, nobody is accepted by God. You understand the difference? It's, it's completely twisted. God accepts everyone on the basis you're coming to change. But on the basis of coming and saying, I want God to accept me as I am. No, that is the road to hell. That is the road to hell. I want God to accept me just as I am. He'll accept you just as you are to begin changing you into the image of Jesus Christ. But you can't come just as you are and just stay as you are. God accepts everyone. He accepts those who come through Jesus Christ repenting and ready to change. You understand? It's, it's a huge difference. One is a mega church, and one is a, a persecuted little group of people that no one understands. Because, especially in this Canaanite culture, don't look for the Canaanite culture to jump out and accept that message. Because they're trained that that's hate speech. You're, 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 a, you're a bigot. You're racist. You're selfish. You're... I don't know, there's a thousand words for it. I call it Christian. Not being, a, you know, not saying, you know what I'm saying. What a sloppy ending. Okay, I'll pray. And you can go. Father, we do thank you so much for your truth. We thank you for your word. We ask that we may again accept it and walk in your wisdom. Father, we thank you for the good things you've done for us. We desire to understand these things, not to twist them to fit our own desires, but Father, that we would submit ourselves to your lordship and your leadership. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for your patience.